What's going on everyone? I hope this video finds you well. My name is Jonathan Riddell and today we will talk about the conservation of information and the scrambling of information. Scrambling of information has been an extremely hot topic in multiple fields, including uh, black hole physics and the foundations of statistical mechanics. Uh, today we will cover these topics in the context of quantum mechanics and specifically in the context of many body systems that we expect to thermalize or that we expect StatMech to emerge from. We will avoid the open questions of the black hole information loss problem and the measurement problem of quantum mechanics. For a more accessible introduction to this topic, uh, PBS Spacetime did an awesome introduction into conservation of information on their channel, link in the description. And uh, before we get started, just a quick announcement. I will be doing a stream on Sunday the 13th at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern with a special guest, Wyatt Kirkby, uh, who is a friend of mine um, and a collaborator who also happens to work on the scrambling of information. So we will be around to chat about this phenomena and anything else you might be interested uh, to chat about. So I definitely hope to see you there. So let's jump right into it. So first let's cover conservation of quantum information and then we'll talk about why this leads to an interesting insight about the emergence of statistical mechanics. When we talk about quantum information, the principal culprit uh, we are thinking of is the state of the system we, we are in, the quantum state. The state of our system contains everything knowable to us. It is very literally the maximum amount of information we can know about the physical system that we're describing. We know that our state evolves according to the Schrodinger equation where H is the Hamiltonian on our system, which we take to be time independent for our discussion. And that this gives us unitary time evolution, an evolution uh, that conserves probability. We have, as usual here, set Planck's constant uh, to one, and we will continue to do so uh, throughout the remainder of the video. Unitary time evolution means that I can write future states by knowing an initial state and multiplying a matrix U into it, where U is a unitary matrix, meaning that its Hermitian conjugate is its inverse matrix. We know the explicit form of the unitary time evolution matrix and can write it down as the following equation, where we have taken our initial conditions uh, to be at t is equal to zero. This tells us a cool fact that the inverse or the Hermitian conjugate of the time evolution operator uh, can be thought of as a backward time evolution as it rewinds the clock mathematically. So fully knowing a state at t is equal to zero tells us what happened in the past and what, ha what will happen in the future. Something interesting that this does for us is that it gives us unique histories. It's worth noting that in the PBS Spacetime video, they say this and tell their viewer viewers uh, to check in the comments for a proof. So now I will summarize a similar argument uh, that they gave in that video. Suppose we have three states, psi1, psi2, and psi3, all of which are normalized. We are interested in proving that if we can apply a unitary operator u uh, to both psi1 and psi2 to get back psi3, then psi1 and psi2 must be identical. Since psi3 is normalized, uh, we can take the first equation and take its Hermitian conjugate and then take the product with that um, and the second equation. This tells us that the overlap between psi1 and psi2 is 1. And since these two states are normalized, it tells us that they are in fact identical. The deeper meaning of this is that no distinct states can evolve into an identical state at the same time. These paths are unique and we conserved the information of our past because it's unique. 
Briefly jumping into the language of density matrices, unitary time evolution also preserves other details for us that are crucial, like how mixed our state is. If we have our state described by a density matrix at t is equal to zero, uh, we can write the time evolution for a density matrix rho as the following equation, where u is the same time evolution uh, unitary operator as before. Rho can be a pure state, um, as we were discussing previously, or a mixture of pure states called a mixed state. To measure how mixed a state is, one can simply compute the following expression, uh, which is known as the purity. This expression is equal to 1 if and only if the state itself is pure. This expression is also invariant in time due to unitary time evolution. To go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of this final equation, one simply needs to replace the, uh, the inner unitary matrix product with the identity, and then reorganize the equation on the extremities using the cyclic property of the trace, and then replacing, uh, replacing that product again with another identity, and you recover the right-hand side. So information is conserved in quantum mechanics, though to be fair, actually recovering all of this information for a many-body system uh, would basically be uh, impossible. But let's consider an interesting thought experiment. Suppose I have two states, psi1 and psi2, which are pure states. Uh, they are not equal, and they have distinctive initial conditions. For simplicity, uh, let's say that they disagree specifically on the initial conditions of a single observable. Perhaps a single spin operator somewhere on the lattice, or perhaps some other form of local operator. Let's call this observable A. Now let's also choose these states, states such that they have identical energy, that is they have identical expectation values of the Hamiltonian. Then if we are in a system that thermalizes its subsystems, we expect both psi1 and psi2 to evolve to a point where the expectation value of A agrees with the expectation value of statistical mechanics, uh, which is set by the energy of the system. Here the beta subscript on the expectation value is just the inverse temperature, and since both states have identical energies, the temperature is identical for both states. So they go to an equilibrium that, for the observable A, looks identical. Are we somehow losing information in this process? It certainly looks that way, right? Uh, the states look identical according to this thought experiment, and they had extremely distinct initial conditions. And to be clear, this is what we expect to happen. The observable should start to agree with equilibrium statistical mechanics. For more information on why that's the case, take a look at my video on the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, link in the description. The key insight here is that we actually aren't losing information, we are just scrambling the local information across the system. Suppose, suppose my system is a lattice with some local degrees of freedom, perhaps spins interacting, um, it could also be fermions or bosons hopping and interacting on the lattice. The dynamics are governed by some Hamiltonian H, uh, which for simplicity, uh, we assume only connects the lattice sites directly uh, connected to each other in the figure. So for example, our central lattice site could be labeled uh, as site 1, and it would interact with its neighbors. Then scrambling of information can be understood as a process of an observable that is initially local in space, uh, becoming non-local in time. Pic pictorially, it can be thought of as follows. Suppose the observable starts at our lattice site 1. Then we show its support on the lattice uh, by this blue box. 
Support here means that the observable has non-trivial, non-zero terms on observables at different points on the lattice. Then the observable becomes non-local by picking up support on more and more lattice sites. So to construct the past, one would need to measure and investigate the properties of larger and larger systems to reconstruct the information of the past. To see why this happens, we can take a more mathematical approach. Let's proceed in the Heisenberg picture with some state psi, which we might say is either psi1 or psi2 uh, from before. We are interested in understanding the observable as a function of time, which can be written in terms of the time evolution operator as seen here. To investigate this further, we can look at the Hadamard lemma, which tells us that the evolution of the observable A can be rewritten as the following expression, uh, which we write out to second order, but it's sort of easy to see what the third, fourth, uh, etc. terms would be. So there's a lot going on in this equation. The square brackets are the commutators as usual in quantum mechanics. Uh, the, quantum, the commutator terms are time independent, so the time evolution comes directly from the scalars uh, t here, uh, which are out front of the terms in the series. Since the Hamiltonian connects neighboring regions, each new nested commutator will pick up terms from the next region as A picks up uh, some initial term it doesn't commute with, and then in turn won't commute with something else uh, in the commutator, and so on and so forth inside all of these nested commutators. So to recover the initial conditions, of the observable A, one would need to try and recover the information covering a larger and larger region of our system as A of T contains more and more information uh, from outside its initial region of support. So that is scrambling of information, a process that makes it in practice impossible uh, to recover initial conditions when studying many body systems, and in some sense is absolutely vital for thermalization and the emergence of statistical mechanics in systems like the one we were talking about. Scrambling has been an extremely hot topic in the last few years and is still an active topic with many open questions. But that's uh, all for today. I hope you liked the video. If you did, feel free to like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. And I definitely hope to see you at the stream.